Jesus, Lord of harvest, and hope he'll smile, and that he'll say, well done. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today is given us lost souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning today we'll go to bring some sinner in friendship, a house or car, or garments fair or fame, will all be trash when souls are brought to heaven, and then how sad to face the slacker's blame. Today we reap or miss our golden harvest. Today souls to win. Oh, then to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. The harvest white with reapers view is wasting, and many souls will die and never know the love of christ the joy of sins forgiven oh let us weep and love and pray and go today we reap or miss our golden harvest today is given us lost souls to win to save some dear ones from the burning. Today we'll go to bring some sinner in. Thank you very much. I want to give just a little word of explanation to those of you who are maybe newer uh, to the church this year. We're having a Faith Promise Sunday. And if you're visiting with us, that you would understand that what we're doing today is unusual. We do this once a year. And what that is, is we challenge ourselves about what we can do as we're trusting the Lord with our abundance by faith, uh, to give to missions around the world. We as a local church do above our, our tithe or our special offerings. This is our missions giving. And um, we're, we're just about at the three million dollar mark uh, that we've given to missions these last years. And that's just staggering. And that can't happen without you and all of us getting involved. And so would you be prayerful as Brother Edwards, he's no stranger to our church. He's going to come and preach for us on this subject. So, brother, so wonderful to have you today. Good to be here, Pastor. Thank the you. Lord bless you. Appreciate the opportunity. Good to see you this morning. Um, Pastor has given me liberty just to take a moment. Uh, you were given a magazine, and that magazine is from God and Country. I know you know Byron Fox, and if I don't do what I'm told, Byron Fox whips me, and so I've got to be <laughs> obedient to him. It is a, I know you know that our nation stands at a crossroads. This magazine in no way is about endorsing candidates or urging people to do anything but be good stewards of our citizenship. The implication of the magazine is to pray, to witness, and to vote. 
we need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for revival in our nation. Part of praying for our nation and seeing a turn in our nation is to witness. And we have got to win the loss. That is how our nation will be turned, is when people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and have biblical values. And then we urge you as Christian citizens, we've been given a great privilege to live in this place. Let's steward our citizenship by voting. In this magazine, there are a number of articles, uh, Dr. Gibbs, uh, uh, Brother Scott Pauley, Brother Fox, Brother Alvis, uh, others have great articles in here. I also, I urge you to read this magazine. It will be of great help to you. I also just want to draw attention, and I'll see if I can find it quickly, but in here is a QR code that will take you to a page. Um, this, it is also in digital version. It's right on the front page as you turn in. There's a digital version. We, we just can't get a magazine to every human being we want to, but online you can go read everything that is in this magazine as well. All of it is in audio. And so you may be driving, you don't have time to read with the magazine, uh, but you can go and listen to the articles while you're driving to work or in some other fashion that makes it a lot more convenient. Please read the magazine, share the magazine, share the truth that it is digitally available. And uh, let's pray for our nation as we approach perhaps the most important election season that you and I have ever experienced in our life. Having said all that, let's turn to the Word of God and talk about missions. I urge you, if you would, to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Pastor, thank you for the privilege of being here. I love, I am, I bleed Virginia. I no longer live in Virginia. They ran me out. But uh, I love Virginia. Pastored, uh, crossed the way over in Woodbridge for 38 years. And uh, love every opportunity I get to come back to this great state. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's begin reading in verse 14. You listen fast, I'm going to preach fast. I won't get done early, but I'm going to preach fast, okay? Look at verse 14. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity, and I pray that you would now put your hand upon this service. This is your word. Uh, these are your purposes. This is your intention for our lives. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take your word and apply it to every heart. Meet needs in this room this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll make a statement that is obvious. The world is immense. I don't mean just geographically, but it is a large place geographically. But what I mean by that is, when I think about the world and, and all the peoples that populate this earth, I'm told, I don't know for sure, but I read it on the internet, so it must be true, that there are 8 billion people on planet Earth. I get lost at 100. I can't comprehend 8 billion people. Not only that vast number of people, but I want you to think about all the languages that are spoken, all the people groups, all the types of governments that, that uh, people live under. Think of all the cultures and all the, the colors and, 
And it's just mind-boggling how immense this world is. And then bring it to this thought, that there is one name by which all of those people must be and can be saved. It is the name Jesus Christ. And here's the mind-amazing thing to me. God knows and loves every person Amen. on this planet. God is not concerned in as far as loving them about what color they are or what portion of this planet they occupy. He, he's not even mad at them because unaware of who he is, they may worship something else. God loves them. And listen, one of the things you and I ought to be incredibly glad of is that on our best days, God loves us, but on our worst days, God still loves us. God loves the people on this planet. Now here's my problem. I'm not as big as God. And sometimes my world becomes so small. Can I be honest with you? Most days that I live my life, if it's not affecting the three-foot circle around me, I'm not really sure I care a whole lot. And I'm not saying that's cute. I'm not saying that's right. I'm saying that's us. And it's easy to become focused on what impacts me and lose focus on the much bigger picture that our God sees. And one of the things that a missions meeting, a missions conference can do in our lives is help us to lift up our eyes and see beyond our world and see a little bit more of what God sees as the great need and the great purpose in this, in this world. I think that's who the Apostle Paul was. He was a man who lived beyond. The Bible tells us he lived beyond his measure. I won't go back and reread the verses. It tells us that he was a man who was interested in the regions beyond. It even tells us that he was a man who encouraged us to live beyond our means. Now I guarantee you that needs explanation and I will explain it in the message. But he was a man who lived beyond himself. And he challenged us to be the same kind of people in God's world. I want you to notice those three things with me. Number one, Paul lived beyond his measure. Verse 14 for we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. You have to understand that the Corinthians and the Apostle Paul at times had kind of an adversarial relationship. The Corinthian church didn't like his authority all the time. Uh, they didn't like his message to them and his expectations. And sometimes they would bark back at him a little bit. Why They would accuse him of not being a strong preacher, not being a, a strong physical specimen. And, and even in this passage, beyond what we're seeing, what they're saying to the Apostle Paul is this. Paul, you're always talking about reaching the world. You're always talking about uh, uh, trying to tell others about Christ and going to this place and that place. And, and in essence, what they're saying is, Paul, we've got problems here in Corinth. We've got needs here in Corinth. And Paul, you talk about reaching the world, but you can't reach the whole world. And I love what Paul says back to them. You know what he says? He says this. We reached you. And in that simple statement, we reached unto you. You know what he was saying? He was saying this. There has always been people who says it can't be done. In Jerusalem, when God gave that great, he gave his sacrifice, gave his son, and, and we saw the birth of that Christian faith in that place, God's expectation was that they go and tell the world, but instead they hunkered down inside the walls of Jerusalem because they didn't think the rest of the world could receive that message. Oh, God sent persecution. And you know what they found out? They found out that you could go to Samaria. Samaria preached the gospel and people would get saved. 
Well, maybe Samaria because there's some heritage of Judaism there. Now, we don't like them anymore, but maybe they could understand it. But you know what happened? It not only went to Samaria, it went to Antioch. Antioch was a pure Gentile city. And you know what happened when the gospel arrived at that pure Gentile city? Gentiles got saved right and left. There was an amazing evangelistic meeting so great that the city of Antioch, a Gentile city, became the place where they were first called Christians and where the missionary movement to reach a world was launched. And I've got good news for you. There was a day that the Apostle Paul was trying to take the gospel deeper into Asia, and God just kept closing door after door after door. He got frustrated. He went back to the city of Troas and said, God, what are you trying to show me? That night as he slept, he got a vision, and in that vision, he saw a Macedonian man saying, come over over here and help us. And the next morning he booked fare on a ship, jumped an ocean, the Aegean Sea, and for the first time the gospel was preached on a new continent, uh, Europe. And you know what? People got saved and churches got planted. I've got wonderful news for you. The gospel jumped another ocean called the Atlantic. And you and I sit in this room today because there is no border, there is no boundary that can stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we sit around and say, well, I don't know what I can do. I don't think what I can give will make a difference. No. Our measure is never enough. But pour God into our measure. Pour God into our efforts. Pour God into our church. And nothing can stop the gospel, not even the gates of hell. Hey, the very purpose of a meeting like this is to allow the Holy Spirit to encourage us that with Him it can be done. Here's number two. Paul was a man who was interested in reaching beyond his borders. Look at verse 16. He wanted to preach the gospel beyond, in the regions beyond you. One of the great questions in our nation today is who comes into our country legally and illegally? And I don't know that I'm smart enough to know all the answers. I hope somebody's trying to figure that answer out. But I'll tell you what our focus this morning is. Who's leaving to go tell the world that Jesus Christ can save? The church ought to be more concerned not about their seating capacity, but their sending capacity. Who are we sending to a lost world? Paul was a man interested in reaching the, the regions beyond. Around 42 AD, Paul got saved. He spent some silent years in the desert being taught of others, but also being taught by the Lord himself. Around 46 AD, he began traveling the world preaching the gospel. And for the next 15 years, he traveled by foot, by ship. He was supported by others, but also when needed, he worked as a tent maker. He preached in cities and in villages. He preached both in and out of season. He preached in Jerusalem, North Africa, Asia Minor, Greece, the islands of the Mediterranean, Italy, and even in the capital of the Roman Empire itself, Rome. I am convinced if he would have had a Tesla, he could have reached the entire globe. <laughs> if he could have found some place to plug it in. He preached to Jews, but he also preached to pagans. He preached to paupers, but he wasn't afraid to preach the gospel to the kings also. Anyone that would listen to include those people who kept him in prison. I'm just saying there was no border or barrier that could keep him out if it was the Lord's will that he go in. He literally lived the Great Commission. I love that statement, the regions beyond. But I got to thinking, I can understand what that meant for Paul the regions beyond. But, but to be honest with you, in our day, we can get on an airplane and we can be anywhere on the globe in 24 hours. And 
I don't know any place on earth that hasn't at least been explored. I'm not saying it's been gospel enriched, but it's been explored. What are the regions beyond for us? And I love what one commentator said. He said, the regions beyond for us is simply this, still further, still further. As an older man, can I tell you one of the greatest fears I have for my life? It is that I will come to the place in my life where I say, I've done enough. I've studied enough. I've preached enough. I've, I've gone soul winning enough. I've given enough. I've sacrificed enough. Let somebody else. May I never come to that place in my life. And church, listen to me. Nearly $3 million are over. This church has given to the cause of reaching the world for Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful accomplishment. It is not enough. It is not the end. It is not that we can come to the place and say, satisfied with what we've done, let some other church carry the banner from here on in. Hey, listen, I am saying that every day we are to be intentional in how we live for the Lord and obey what is close to the heart of the Lord. And every season we challenge ourselves to grow. And every season of the year and every season of our lives, whether we are young or whether we are old, we we are challenging ourselves that there is still further I can go in my service to and my dedication to the Lord Jesus. C.T. Studd, that's a great name. He's a great man. He was a cricket player. Now, we don't know much about cricket, but if you were an Englishman at the turn of the last century and you were a professional cricket player, you were a big deal. But he made a decision one evening. He went to a D.L. Moody rally. He went in, lost, and came out, saved, and it changed the entire direction of his life. He became a missionary and gave his life to the Lord. And he said this, If Jesus Christ is God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. That kind of passion ought to guide our lives wherever we are in our lives. There is still further that I can go. And then Paul was not only a man who lived beyond his measure, trusting the Lord to make him able. He was not only a man who was willing to go anywhere still further in his service to the Lord, he was a man that both lived beyond his means and encouraged others to live beyond their means. Now look at me. I am the most frugal, tight man you have ever met in your life. I buy used and I don't change anything, okay? I am not suggesting that we are to be foolish in our spending. But I am suggesting that we are to live by faith in our giving. Notice with me what he says in verse, six, uh, verse 15. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Paul, what are you saying there? I'm saying this, Brother Edwards. I'm saying that I'm trying to reach a world for Christ, and it is beyond what I can do by myself. And I need partners in the ministry. And God, in His wisdom, ordained the local church to be the source and the resource for others to be able to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. And, and Brother Edwards, I'm praying every day that your faith will be increased so that I can be enlarged. You know what he's saying? I'm praying that God will lead you to give more so that you will give to me so that I am able to preach the gospel. It has nothing to do with buying new cars. It has nothing to do with lives of convenience. I don't know any man who lived a less comfortable and more inconvenient life than the Apostle Paul. 
But it was about being able to reach that new place, being able to go there and give himself to ministry. And he's saying, I'm praying that your faith is increased so that you can give to me to enlarge me, to enable me to go further, to reach the world. And we're going to study tonight. And here's the wonderful thing about it, pastor and church. As you give to me and I'm winning souls over here, those souls are going to abound to your account as well. It's a wonderful circle of faith. God loves sacrificial giving. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is, I'm praying you'll be willing to sacrifice and give so that I can go. And then as we work as a team, the fruit that we see will abound to both of our accounts. God calls us to live by faith. Can I give you what I personally believe, and it's only my opinion, is the most beautiful picture of faith promise in the Bible? You see, sometimes we live our lives timidly. We live our lives conveniently. We live our lives willing to go to the point where I can see how I can do that, but to take that step over is to trust God to do. God's going to have to do something if that's the case. And we live our lives on this side of that line too often. And if we ever want to see God truly work and really experience God's power, we've got to step over to where we say, God, if I have to do without, I'm going to trust you for this. Let me give you that illustration. There was a prophet named Elijah. You know him. And Elijah, oh, he got, he obeyed the Lord and it got him in a little bit of hot water. And he had to go hide by the brook Cherith. And there for a time God fed him by the raven and he drank from the brook. But but he had prophesied and promised a drought and so the brook dried up. And God said to Elijah, Elijah, I want you to go to Zarephath and there I want you to be sustained by a widow. Every man in this room would have had a visceral reaction if the Lord said to us, I want you to be sustained by the widow. Wait a minute, Lord, you've got that backward. We're men. We do the sustaining for the widow. You don't expect me to go and and just live there and the widow take care of me. Lord, you can't mean that. And God did mean that. God is revealing something here. So Elijah obeys. He goes to that place and he goes to that widow's home. And there he knocks on that door. And I don't know exactly how the conversation went, but he says in some way, hey, God has sent me here. And and here's God's word. God wants you to take care of me. God wants you to sustain me. And the widow says back to him, well, you've arrived on a real difficult day. Because here's the case, I've got enough meal and enough oil, I was going to go just now and prepare a little cake for myself and a little cake for my son. We were going to eat that cake, prophet, and then we were just going to sit here and die because there's nothing else. And I want you to get a hold of this, men. Elijah says, Elijah says, Make me a cake first. Can I guarantee you he wanted to rip his tongue out of his body? Can I tell you it was the hardest words that he ever said? But he had to obey God, and it's what God had said. Hey, the hero of this story is not Elijah. The heroine of this passage is that woman. Because now that woman has got a choice. That woman has heard this is the word of God. This is what God wants you to do. And you are not in a place of prosperity. You want to talk about a fixed income? Two little cakes. That's fixed. (laughs) You've got a choice. 
Do I listen to what God says? Do I trust God? And do I put this prophet first above myself and my son? Do I sacrificially make this cake for him? That godly, good woman said yes. And she fashioned that cake, put it down at the table. Get this. He sat down and ate it and said, go check and see if there's more. And you know what? There was more. There was enough meal and enough oil for her. Hey, you know what there was the next day? Oh, enough. You know what there was the next day? Enough. The next day, enough. How far are you want me to run this out? There was always enough because God, her faith brought God's promise and God supplied. Now, at some point, I know me, I'd have said, God, will you just fill the barrel up? Every day there was enough. That's faith promise. And that's the kind of life that Paul led. And that's the kind of life that the Bible lays out for us. And you and I have got to make decisions based on God's Word, based on our timidity. Let me tell you one more story and I'll be finished. 1904, William Borden, young man, graduated from high school for his graduation present, by the way, many of us know Elsie the cow. He was the heir of the Borden Dairy, a phenomenally rich family. Uh, on his graduation, his father gave him a trip around the world because he wanted to make him a businessman and wanted him to see other cultures and figure it out. On that great trip around the world, he didn't learn to be a better businessman. God spoke to his heart, and he, and he was called to be a missionary. Well, his father was deeply upset with that, but we'll send him to Yale University. He'll get that foolishness out of his head. He went to Yale University, and he was an evangelist. He, he started a mission down on the streets of New Haven, won his classmates to the Lord, never lost the zeal to be a missionary. Upon graduation from college, while he was on that trip, he had seen a, a group of people called the Kanzu people in Mongolia, part of China. Strange thing, these people in China spoke Arabic. We refer to them as the Uyghurs today. They're being incredibly persecuted. And he wanted to reach these Kanzu people. To do so, he had to go to Cairo, and there at Cairo learn Arabic. And then his plan was to go to Mongolia to reach these people. 25 days after he arrived in Cairo, one of the wealthiest young men in all the world contracted spinal meningitis. Today, we could heal spinal meningitis, not then and not there. And 30 days after he contracted that meningitis, he died in that Cairo hospital. All oh, the news headlines said, wasted life. Could have been, but wasted life. They found his Bible and his journal. And in his journal, they found this phrase, no reserves, no retreats. No regrets. But his life was over at such a young age. No regrets. Obeying the Lord allows us to come to the end of our lives whenever and however God chooses without regrets. You know what I want for my life? I want to come to the end of my life without regrets. I wasn't saved as a child. I wasn't saved until I was a married man and a father. We, we spent so many years not knowing the Lord. I can't undo that. But I don't want to waste what God has given me since He has so graciously saved me. Amen. And sometimes I get self-focused. and Sometimes I get timid about my faith. And I want to live like the Apostle Paul. And I want to live like that woman. And I want to say, this is what God says. And this is what God promises. And I'm going to step over. And I'm going to trust God to do in my life what only God can do. Because I don't want to hold anything back. 
And I don't want to pull back from this life he's given me. And I don't want to meet him and say, ah, I kind of regret. Did you know that nobody is going to say before God, boy, I sure regret giving to missions. At the Bema seat, nobody's going to say, man, do I regret all the time I spent in church. Wish I'd have gone on more cruises. I'm not preaching against cruises, okay? I'm just saying nobody's going to say that. I think the songwriter encapsulated it the best. <laughs> by and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, thorn-shadowed face, by and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more, more, so much more, more of my life than I e'er gave before. By and by, when I look on his face, I wish I'd given him more. Thank you, widow lady, for having the sheer faith in what God's Word says to make that cake for that prophet. Thank you, Paul, for challenging us to be part of reaching a world. God, help us to see that the most worthy sacrifice we can make is for your work to reach others. You know what God loves? God loves when I put me aside and others first. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for the day. Thank you for your blessings on our lives. Lord, you've so blessed us. Help us as we come to this moment to just be thoughtful. We have these cards in our hands and it challenges us because there's so many things that we need to do or would like to do with the resources we have. And sometimes we feel like our resources are so small, but how, how could they be smaller than what the widow lady had? And yet when we're willing to look beyond our world, to look into the needs of others, to understand that you can multiply even the little that we have. And how you're so pleased when we'll move us off the throne of our life, put you on it and see the needs of others. God, help us to not live so timidly, but by faith to trust you. Lord, I pray for those in this room today who maybe have not been convinced yet of what you want them to do. May you prayerfully speak to their hearts, Holy Spirit, and reveal that to them. Maybe they need to take some moments this morning and allow you to do that. Lord, I understand this is a different day and topic, and there may be those that are here that are offended that we've spoken of giving money. God, please help them to understand none of it stays here. None of it is for us. All of it goes to reach a lost world, a hurting world. And Lord, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, oh, we want to reach all the world, but we want to reach this room. And if there's one that has never come to know Christ, we'd love to take a Bible and show them how to be saved. Now, Lord, would you work in our hearts? Would you help us to purpose to not be timid, but to look beyond our world and see yours? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you quietly stand to your feet? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask the pianist to just play a verse. If God's spoken to your heart, maybe you just want to have a conversation with God where you are. Maybe you'd like to spend a moment at the altar. Would you come as the pianist plays? God help us.
Let's go ahead and be seated, please. I'm going to do something a little different. Um, I don't know about you, but I, uh, the Lord really challenged me this morning. And I, I just want to ask all of us, is it sacrificial? Is it by faith? I don't believe I can respond properly. I've already written a, a note to my wife in the last five minutes about our faith promise. Um, I'm going to ask the pianist to pray, and I'm going to take a few minutes and be prayerful about what God would have us to do. Okay? Um, everyone in the auditorium, we're going to just stop for a moment. Maybe husbands and wives need to have a fresh conversation. Um, I want you to think over what would God want after what we have heard are you involved in giving the faith promise in this church? If you haven't started, please do that. Would God have you do more than what you're doing? So I want you to have some private conversations with the Lord or one another for just a couple minutes, and then we'll take up our faith promise, all right, as the pianist plays. <laughs> 